And hello, friends, and welcome to another episode of Chapters here on Armstrong Cable. Chapters is the television show that profiles local authors, editors, and publishers in our community. I'm Elliot Parker, and it's great to have you with us. We're delighted to have author Josh Higginbotham with us today, and we're going to talk about his political fiction book, Ecclesiastes. He is the author of that book, Ecclesiastes, and he's also an active member in his church and, a com and his community. He's a volunteer in numerous, numerous charitable organizations. He's also worked for the United States Senate and he desires to see souls saved, lives changed, and mouths fed through his pillar philosophies, which is Christianity, conservatism, and minimalism. Currently, he is a student at the University of Charleston, where he is de deciding currently what to, what to major in, and he also lives humbly with his loving family uh, in the mountain state of West Virginia. And we're delighted to have uh, Josh Higginbotham with us today to talk about his book, Ecclesiastes. Josh, welcome to Chapters. Thanks so much for being here. Well, thank you. It's a pleasure. Tell me a little bit about this book, this political fiction story called Ecclesiastes. How did it come about? Where did you get the idea? Where did all this come from? Well, it is pretty complicated. So what happened was uh, I've written two previous books. I was 15 and 16 when I wrote those. But uh, a couple of years ago, I was working for the United States Senate, and I was uh, you know, working alongside of Harry Reid and Mitch McConnell and uh, Vice President Joe Biden, and I saw just what politics was like real, in real life firsthand. And I decided that I wanted to write a fiction uh, about politics in D.C., uh, particularly about the corruption behind it. And so what I did was, uh, I'm also a person of faith, I am a Christian, and I took my favorite book in the Bible called Ecclesiastes, and I reapplied the same theme into a modern fiction based on politics. Fantastic. So how long did you work uh, in the United States Senate and what was it like? You mentioned you, you saw really how the sausage was made, so to speak, with politics. But what was it like rubbing elbows or rubbing shoulders with some of the most powerful politicians in our country? Well, it was very interesting, especially because I was only 16 at the time. So at first it was pretty intimidating, but as I really uh, stepped out and got used to it, uh, I learned so much. Uh, I saw that in public every politician is grand and there are all these family values and these wonderful things that people aspire to to be but in private they're some of the rudest people you'd ever meet <laughs> and so uh, that just reflects on their policy and everything else that they're doing uh, in their lives and uh, it was a very rewarding experience for me. So tell us a little bit about the plot line of Ecclesiastes. You mentioned that comes from, or the title comes from your favorite book in the Bible. What goes on in terms of the plot of this particular book? I don't want to give too much away, but I'll go ahead and tell you a little bit uh, of a synopsis. Uh, it follows along the story of two characters. They're rivaling political figures. Names are Locke and Payne. And it's this battle between the two of them, good and evil, right and wrong, uh, whatnot. And... Along with this drama, the entire city of Washington, D.C. is surrounded by an enemy that the reader doesn't know who, who it is. Uh, obviously, the characters do, but the readers, they don't know until the very end. And it is about discovering who the enemy in the story is. And that will certainly surprise you. So where did your inspiration come from for writing that kind of a story because you've got the politics from your experience there but yeah. but sort of that mystery thriller kind of genre where did that come from is that something that you've always enjoyed reading as a reader or was that something that sort of filtered in from your experiences working uh, in the U.S. Senate well as for reading oddly enough I don't read very much fiction <laughs> I read mostly nonfiction, uh, which most people are quite surprised by but uh, mostly my experiences uh, mostly stuff with the Senate, um, other political activities I'm involved in, and just seeing how life goes about uh, around me. I'm an observer. Excellent. Tell us a little bit about those two characters you mentioned just a moment ago, because uh, in reading the book, I think one of the things that will stand out is, is they're similar in some ways, but they're different in other ways. Yeah. But 
they're great characters to follow as the narrative unfolds. Mm-hmm. Tell us a little bit about them and sort of their characteristics and their characterization and how you decided to write them those way, the way that, that you did. Well, they're very round characters. They change, and you discover certain things about them that will uh, make your opinion change uh, about them. And um, as I said, their names are Locke and Payne, John Locke and Thomas Payne, the uh, characters or the figures from uh, our founding fathers. And... Um, what I decided to do was take the different political views of those two historical characters and apply them into these fictional characters. Uh, and so as for their personalities, one is the more conservative, uh, family-style person, very into his faith. Uh, he's a hypocrite, though, because he's a politician. And then the other is uh, more of a, uh, a loose cannon who never really had a family or, or a life. And so that's why they're, they're so uh, opposites. And I did that because I wanted it to represent political polarization in the United States. Currently, in our government, we are seeing far left and far right and not very much in the middle. And that's why you never see anything accomplished in D.C. or in Charleston or wherever your capital is. And so that's what I wanted it to represent with these two characters. And I think one of the things that's interesting, too, about about Locke and Payne is you know, the, 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 there's a sort of a moral thread that runs through here. Decisions are having to be made, which questions their morals, and it helps develop them uh, into challenging characters. Uh, you mentioned that having some of the experiences working with Congress and, and meeting Harry Reid, Mitch McConnell, and some other yeah. senators, uh, you see their public persona, their private persona. Uh, do you find Locke and Payne kind of deal with, with very much a, uh, a private persona as opposed to their persona in which they're having to interact with others in the book? Mm-hmm. Yeah, I do. Uh, Payne, at one point in the story, uh, it talks about how he had this plaque uh, that said, in, as for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. And it talks about the hypocrisy of that, because he doesn't even believe in God in the story. And so, um, you know, that was meant to be a public statement, was that phrase. And it goes to show the real lies that all politicians, left and right, Democrat, Republican, that they all say in order to get approval from the voters. Interesting, very interesting. And it's such a great book, and we'll talk more about it here, too, in just a second. But how would you get interested in politics? <laughs> well, I went to Washington, D.C. with my dad in, uh, I think it was 2009 or 2010, but I was 13. And there was a political rally going on at the Capitol. And we didn't know what it was about, so we just headed down there. My dad hates politics, but I was like, (laughs) man, this is really fun. And I just got into it from there, and it went uphill. So I began writing about it, working uh, alongside the newspapers with different uh, political figures here in the state of West Virginia and uh, my books, and it just hasn't stopped. Great. How did you go about getting that job? working in the United States Senate. What was that process like? Was there an application? Did you have to be interviewed? Did you have to go back to D.C. Uh, as a part of that process? How, how did you get in, How did you get that job there working in the U.S. Well, Senate? Well, I was a student ambassador to uh, six different European countries, and that opened the doors. Um, I'd written my first book beforehand, but I was able to meet Senator Joe Manchin uh, during a visit to D.C. And uh, being a student ambassador, I had the experience of government and uh, other ways of uh, you know serving my country abroad and he offered me the position uh, of page in the US Senate which was a very fantastic uh, job <laughs> which I enjoyed so for those folks who may not know what that is what does a page do uh, you have the senators you have their staff you have the interns you have the janitors and then you have the pages <laughs> and so <laughs> But we basically run the Senate. Uh, We um, run errands. We do anything and everything that the senators don't want to do. But we are actually in the Senate chamber, uh, and only the senators are allowed in there and us, which is pretty cool. That is. That's really neat. So let me put you on the spot here. Uh, Which politician do you like the best after that experience, and which politician do you not like the best? And and I don't mean that, you know, personally, just, you know, in terms of, because they all have their own personalities, and and when you're in that position and you have those responsibilities, uh, personalities can get melded and changed over time. But Mm -hmm. but, but who who did you come away with from that experience, really, maybe admiring more, maybe likes, not the right word, but admiring more, and maybe uh, on the flip side of that, thinking someone was some 
occupied some stature in your mind, but then you realize at the end, well, you know, that wasn't really somebody I admired so much after all. Well, um, not getting into politics, just in personality. I really learned to like Marco Rubio from Florida. Very friendly person, always uh, very easy to speak with. Uh, and then not so good, uh, two senators, Senator Feinstein from California and then Senator John McCain from, uh, I believe, Arizona. So those two were not too nice, but uh, yeah, Rubio was, and uh, Senator Rockefeller from West Virginia, he was pretty nice too, and, and just very easy to work with. Great, that's terrific. I, I wanted to read one quote that pops up in the, in the summary uh, of your book and, and have you comment on it, um, and that is, but in the end, as with all biblical endings, God reveals his true intentions, and the enemy has, his, has a different identity than what one would expect or suspect. And tell us a little bit about that, that particular description and how that ties into what goes on in your book. Sure. Well, as I said in the description of the book earlier, the enemy, you don't know who it is, not until the very end. And um, I wanted it... I wanted this book to really question who the traditional good guys and the bad guys are, because every story has a very clearly defined antagonist and protagonist, but I didn't want this to do that, because in reality, in politics especially, those lines are blurred, and good and evil is pretty gray uh, in D.C. And so saying, I am the enemy, which is, in my opinion, the most formidable quote from the book, uh, and one of the main themes, is that the bad guys aren't who you would expect them to be. And the people who you think are good are usually only out there for self-interest or for special interests. I was gonna, I'm glad you mentioned that about the, the bad guy not being defined, because for a lot of readers who read thrillers and, and mystery stories, mm -hmm. there is kind of this this dark cloaked person that's always in the corner yeah. kind of observing what's going on, sort of very great Gatsby-esque in terms yeah. of how things are, are done in the story. But, but in your book, there isn't that. You, you don't get a sense of who it is, and everybody is kind of pushed to that, that left or right side or out of the, that gray shadow of good and evil like you mm -hmm. were talking about. I wanted to ask you about Ecclesiastes. You mentioned that was your favorite book in the Bible. Yeah. How does some of the themes of that book from the Bible, for our audience who may not be familiar with that, tie into what you're doing in your book? What, what are some of the connective themes there that go from that biblical book to your book? Well, the biblical book talks a lot about the meaning and purpose of life. And one of the main parts of my book, my version of Ecclesiastes, is that the characters are looking for meaning in their lives. Uh, even though they are very, both very successful, even though uh, you know, one has a family and uh, you know, good everyday life, the, the typical politician that we see, uh, it's not necessarily true. And the biblical book of Ecclesiastes talks about the ways in which people can find peace and wisdom and happiness in their life. And I addressed that in Ecclesiastes and presented the solutions to loneliness, to depression, to um, you know, uh, people who are afraid of dying. Uh, I, I tried to answer those questions in here, but basing it off of the Bible. Interesting. I think that's really interesting. Um, what was your writing process like for putting this book together? Uh, when did you get the idea? What was the drafting process like? What was the revision process like all the way up until uh, you were ready to send that off for publication? Uh, sporadic <laughs> would be a good way to, to describe it. Uh, at the time, I was a full-time student. I was a senior in high school when I was writing it. And I was also running for the international president of uh, a very large student organization. And uh, that was interesting. Um, so it was only whenever I could do it. Um, so I was pretty busy. But once I finished it in November 2013, uh, I sent it to a bunch of publishing houses in New York and California and Texas. And uh, within a week, seven had accepted it. Yeah, seven had wow. accepted it. And uh, I chose Electio Publishing in Dallas, Texas. And for six months from January to June, it was just back and forth, correct this, change this here and there, and working on the marketing as well. And we released it on my 18th birthday on July, uh, in July of uh, this year. 
And since then, it's been in dozens of newspapers. We've been on One America News, uh, The Washington Times. This week we'll have something, uh, a lot of talk radio, The Parker J. Cole Show in uh, uh, Detroit. Uh, I was actually on The Veto and Veto Show in New York on 9-11, which was an amazing opportunity to discuss how far America has come since then. But the overall reviews and um, opinions of my readers have been an outpouring of support. That's great. You mentioned seven publishers accepted it. Why did you decide to go with Electo Publishing out of Dallas? They were a Christian publisher. They had uh, a very good corporate motto, which is first century principles with a 21st century approach, which I really liked uh, because it kind of relates back to my book, which is biblically based, but reapplied for modern readers. And um, they were um, just, uh, okay, the royalties too. That was pretty nice. <laughs> but <laughs> starting out, it was the, the message. Very good, very good. So you mentioned uh, where this book has been has been profiled on radio, and, mm -hmm. and the Washington Times is going to have a story coming up uh, on that, which is terrific. Was that something that, that you set up through your connections working in the Senate? Was that something the publisher took care of? Was it a sort of a team effort? You kind of contacted sources you had. They contacted sources they had. Because one of the questions we get all the time uh, through email and off the show is, you know, I've got a product I, or I have something published, but I don't know how to market it. You yeah. know, it, it, it's been out for a year. It's sitting on the bookshelf at this bookstore. But, mm -hmm. you know, I want to cast my net wider, get more readers interested in it. So how did the marketing angle work for you with Ecclesiastes? Well, thankfully, the student organization that I ran for the president of, uh, it was, uh, had about 10 million members <laughs> in uh, all 50 states and uh, 10 countries. And it is a marketing organization. So I learned a lot from that group about how to market, uh, about how to get my name out there, and having that platform of being uh, an international officer really helped uh, build connections, and that uh, helped with my government jobs, with the Senate, and uh, with as a student ambassador. And, um, you know, the publishers, they did quite a bit, too. They provided the press releases, and they made the product available. Uh, just about everywhere and uh, relatable to a lot of people. And I was the one who sent out, me and, and we had other helpers too, but uh, we had uh, sent a press release out to, I think, about a thousand media outlets. But anyways, it was a lot. <laughs> and it was a lot of work, but it's paying off. Yeah, absolutely. What would you say was the hardest part about writing this book and what was the easiest part about writing this book? The hardest part... Um, was ensuring that I was taking the message from the Bible and not misinterpreting it, because I did not want to do that. Or history as well, because it is uh, a lot of historical references in there too. And so we consulted with uh, different pastors and some professors, some writers groups, some people that who uh, I would consider experts on these topics. Uh, but the easiest was probably the publishing part, because I just sent it to them. They're like, yes. <laughs> <laughs> so what was that feeling like for you when you got those seven offers of acceptance and, and you had to make the decision, and you mentioned you chose elect Electo Publishing because of their Christian uh, focus. And I love their motto, by the way, first century principles in a 21st yeah. century time frame. But, but what was that feeling like? Uh, what were your first thoughts? Did, did it seem like... <laughs> Oh my goodness! Here we are. This is th this thing's really going to happen now. Uh, that I've got people interested. What was what was that whole experience like for you? It was humbling, because uh, my first and second books, uh, the first one did not do well. I was 14 when I wrote it, 15 when I published it. I didn't like it, but the second one did better. But it wasn't like whew, bestseller, you know. And uh, you know, thankfully. Because of my books, uh, I've been able to, to pay for college. Being the first Higginbotham to go to college is, is an awesome opportunity. But it's the books that have helped me get there. And getting those acceptance letters for, from those publishers was, as I said, humbling because it reminded me of just how far I've come in the few years since then. Tell us a little bit about writers that you admire or writers that you read or who do you like to read and what genres do you like to read? Well, I, um, as I said, don't read too much fiction, but George Orwell 
is my biggest inspiration. And Aldous Huxley, uh, Glenn Beck's up there. Whether you agree with him politically or not, he's a good writer. Mm -hmm. um, uh, quite a number of other political uh, figures. John, or, well, no, John Green is non-political, but he's he is a fiction writer. Um, but their styles, their way of describing their their books and the setting and uh, the plot is just amazing and so I, I've really been inspired by them. You mentioned that you're 18 years old and talk to us a little bit about feedback that you've received from having this book out and having it doing so well and and have you gotten any sort of eyebrows raised uh, you know here's an 18 year old publishing this 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 bestseller book uh, this political fiction book uh, What's that been like? What are some of the comments that you've received, maybe positive or negative, about being young and having this uh, significant accomplishment that some people in their 50s and 60s are still trying to do? It's been an outpouring of support. Uh, I've had people from all across the country uh, come out and, and say, what a fantastic book. Uh, you know, thank you for, for writing it. It really inspired me. Uh, I spoke at a high school um, a couple weeks ago, and couple hundred students were there but a couple days later about a week later a dozens of letters and one girl said thank you for inspiring me and that no matter how many times you fail never to give up so as I said the outpouring has been amazing and it's just one day at a time so what's your next project what's the next book that you're working on what's the next idea that you're cultivating for possibly the next book college <laughs> so getting through college uh, but I'm I'm pretty preoccupied with Ecclesiastes right now um, but I did do have one idea and I'd like to share that with you and it's called 100 years for $100 and it is a narrative of an organization called the Union Mission and they're nationally but they actually got their start here in West Virginia in Charleston and uh, it started with uh, the founder and he took out a loan for $100, started this charity that feeds today more than 250,000 people a year. Uh, and it's been going around for more than 100 years. And so they asked me to uh, compile the stories of struggling families and homeless people from the century uh, that it was founded until today. Um, and actually, all the, out of the proceeds from Ecclesiastes, we are donating 10% uh, of this to this charity here in West Virginia just so we can um, you know because it inspired me so much this organization to see how much they're lifting other people up and transforming their lives. Do you see yourself somewhere down the road going into politics or venturing into that as a possible career path? It's a possibility but I wanted to be a preacher when I was younger and then I wanted to do politics and then I wanted to uh, be a writer and then I wanted to go into business so I was just back and forth about all these things but thankfully now I'm writing Christian political fictions and it's taking those business and marketing skills to sell them and so I'm kind of using a little bit of everything but I think that whatever God calls me to do I plan on doing whether that be in journalism so be it uh, whether it be in the entertainment industry or in uh, politics and government. All I know is that God is going to call me to leadership somehow. In our final moments with you, Josh, uh, if someone in our audience would like to get in contact with you uh, to talk about writing, to talk about politics, to talk about Ecclesiastes, uh, how can they do that and where can they get a copy of Ecclesiastes? Sure. Well, they can get a copy of Ecclesiastes or any of my books, wherever books are sold. Uh, they can get it from my publisher, electiopublishing.com, Barnes & Noble, Amazon. Um, but they can reach out to me on LinkedIn. They can connect with me there. They can friend me on Facebook or like my page on Facebook. They can follow me on Instagram and Twitter, at Joshua Higginbow 7 uh, they can contact me about doing an interview, about doing a book signing or a speaking engagement. We're doing about three or four a week. Uh, and so we're pretty busy for the next few months. But if you ask, I'm sure we, could, we can squeeze an event in. That's terrific. Joshua Higginbotham, the title of his newest book, Ecclesiastes, a political, Christian-based political fiction story that uh, if our audience has not picked it up and read it yet, they need to. And if you're looking for a good book, a good book that will... 
uh, not only satisfy a variety of different interests and reading tastes, but one that is a true page turner. Uh, I certainly hope they will check that out. It's a terrific book, and we thank you so much for coming on Chapters and talking about it with us today. Of course, thank you for the opportunity. Sure, my pleasure. And we also want to say thanks to the staff and management at Empire Books and News here at Pullman Square in Huntington for providing our studio taping space today. And we encourage you to come by Empire Books and News, check out Josh's book, Ecclesiastes, or any other kind of books that they have here at Empire Books and News. Plus, they also have the largest selection of magazines in the tri-state. So no matter what your reading tastes may be, Charlotte and her staff can get that taken care of for you. And also we want to point out that many of the other writers that we featured on Chapters have their books available for sale here at Empire Books and News. So stop by uh, when you're in town this week or when you have time uh, this upcoming weekend to Empire Books and News at Pullman Square in Huntington and let them get you taken care of for all of your reading needs. And we appreciate them providing our studio taping space. And if you have a question, comment, or story suggestion about this chapter's program or any chapter's program you've seen on Armstrong Cable, we certainly want to hear from you. You can send us an email to the address at the bottom of the screen right here. That's lp4 at zoominternet.net. Keep those comments and feedback coming. We always appreciate that. And we also encourage you to check out the chapter's YouTube page from Armstrong One Wire. If you want to check out this episode of Chapters or watch a previous episode of Chapters that maybe you've missed along the way, you can find that through the address that's also popped up here on the bottom of the screen, and that is www.youtube.com backslash Armstrong One Wire. Go right there, click on the Chapters tab, and we've got over nine hours of interviews from authors, editors, and publishers throughout the tri-state region, so we encourage you to check that out. If there's a program that you've missed or there's a program that you want to watch again, you can find it there at the Armstrong One Wire page, so we encourage you to stop by and check that out if you've not already done so. And that's going to do it for us this time on Chapters. Please come again next time. And in the meantime, stay tuned to this station for news and views that impact you and your community.